Coming in at number five, we have the Perrin family. It's January 1971. A large farmhouse sits in Harrisville, Rhode Island. The Perrin family, Carolyn, Roger, and their five daughters move into what they thought would be their dream home. One night, the family notices strange occurrences happening. A couple of strange noises, as if they hear things moving on their own, a couple chairs. From the first night to the first week, right away though, the incidents got worse over time. It started with a missing broom at first, but then resulted in a paranormal nightmare, to say the least. In researching the home, Carolyn discovered that the same family had owned it for eight generations previous to them, during which time many had died by either drowning, murder, or even hanging. Paranormal investigator team Ed and Lorraine Warren, the New England demonologists, were brought in. This is where it gets haunting. After a walk about the property, they claimed that the home was haunted by a demon named Bathsheba. In fact, a woman named Bathsheba Sherman had lived on the property in the 1800s. Whoever the spirit was, she perceived herself to be the mistress of the home and she resented the new home owners. According to Andrea Perrin, one of the daughters who remembers the night vividly, says the family encountered several spirits in the house that caused them turmoil. Beds levitating in the middle of the night, tall ghostly shadows, and even their bedrooms reeking of rotten meat. Ew. The family avoided going into the basement at all because of a cold, deathly presence. Basements, man, always. The things that went on there were so incredibly frightening. Quote from Lorraine herself. The Warrens made frequent trips to the house over the years and the Perrin family lived there. They performed a seance that had Carolyn Perrin speaking in tongues before she was allegedly thrown across the room by a spirit. The Warrens made frequent trips to the house, but Lorraine insisted that she and her husband would never ever try an exorcism, which must be performed, of course, by by a Catholic priest due to its dangers. The seances apparently allegedly caused Carolyn Perrin to be temporarily possessed one time, which Andrea, their daughter, claims she watched unknowingly from the top of the stairs. Shaken by the seances and concerned for his wife's mental health, Roger Perrin asked the Warrens to leave and stop investigating the house since it was making things even worse. According to Andrea Perrin, the family finally gave in and moved out of the house in 1980. Luckily for them, the presence did not follow them. Number four, the Snedeker house. In 1986, Ed and Lorraine Warren were on the scene yet again. We know these two. They're the superhero duo and couple that have literally riddled this planet most of its dark forces. They arrived and proclaimed the Snedeker house a former funeral home to be absolutely infested with demons. The Haunting in Connecticut, a film very loosely based on the Warrens' versions of events, was released in 2009. In 1986, Carmen and Al Snedeker moved to a small town of Southington, Connecticut, with the purpose of being closer to the hospital at which their oldest son had been treated for Hodgkinson lymphoma. It was while they were moving in that Al made a startling discovery. In the basement, basements again, in particular, the room that was completely embalmed with tables and tools. Okay. The house, it turned out, used to be a funeral home. Oof. Not long after, Carmen says she began experiencing strange phenomena like items disappearing and her children reported seeing strange people in the house, as well as hearing voices and the sounds of hundreds of birds taking flight. Her oldest, who at the time was in the middle of radiation treatment, began to exhibit radical personality shifts, becoming animalistic and angry. Mop water was reported to turn to blood red, and the sense of rotting flesh and decay were reported all throughout the home. She was also frightened of apparitions that she saw one night with long black hair and black eyes, and the other with white hair and white eyes wearing a pinstripe tuxedo. It was then that Carmen decided to contact Ed and Lorraine, along with a few other investigators. The Warrens moved into the house until they'd experienced this present the Snedekers were talking about. During their time in the house, they claimed to have seen firsthand demons in the home, with many team members being slapped and beaten and even slammed to the floor. The Warrens deemed it necessary for a full-scale exorcism, after which the house was judged clear by the Warrens themselves and a peaceful aura then seemed to linger instead of this once cold, dark presence. I mean, it's a funeral home, you know, right off the bat. That's a no-no for me. Number three on this list is the Sengoku period. This was a period that took place in Japan from about 1467 to 1600. Listverse says, the Sengoku period lasting over a hundred years was one of the most defining parts of Japanese history, as well as one of the most influential. A lot of historical Japanese pop culture is set in that period as it was a time of consistent war and rapidly shifting political climate. There were more warlords fighting for territory than you could count 
out as the central power of the Shogun had weakened in recent times. For someone living in that period, war and suffering would have been part of your daily life. Apart from opposing factions regularly raiding villages and towns for supplies, civilians were often caught between battles they had nothing to do with. Of course, that wasn't the case in every village across Japan as many of them thrived due to the shifting landscape too. For those caught between the battles or just lost in the vast swaths of ungoverned Japanese territory though, it was a dangerous time to be in. The period was noteworthy for its brutality and general disregard for human life and gave way to some of the most fearsome samurai warriors in Japanese history. There are a few documentaries on this time period of Japan and they are all very informative and super interesting. It's pretty neat to look back now and see what was going on, but back then, having to live through it, that would have been horrible. It really was like a massive game of risk that everyone was playing. And even if you were just a farmer trying to survive, it didn't matter. You were now caught up in this massive game of risk and your life was constantly on the line. Number two on this list is the Roman Empire. Okay, wait, wait, I thought the Roman Empire was supposed to be one of the greatest empires ever. Well, it was. And if you were one of the leaders or a member of the elite class during this time, then you were laughing. But for some, it wasn't as nice. Specifically, the miners. The Roman Empire had a lot of slaves, mostly people that were taken from conquered territories and forced to work for the Romans. The worst possible place that you could be sent though was the mines. If you were a slave and you got sent to the Roman Empire mines, then life, it's about to get horribly bad. The conditions were awful down there. Mining was relatively new back then and there wasn't really any advanced technology to help these people. Not that they would have received received any help anyways though. The Romans were brutal to these people and specifically handpicked people they didn't like to be sent down there. Disease was widespread because people were literally worked to death and never cleaned. They were given very little food and if they weren't producing quick enough then they would just be killed. And oftentimes these killings were of amusement to the guards as well and they would mutilate you or throw you in a pit with a hungry wild animal. There were literally no redeeming qualities to the mines at all and you probably wished for death if you got sent there. And finally number one on this list is is the year 536. Kind of a specific year here, folks, but from what I've heard, it was literally the worst. This verse says, when us laymen talk about the worst times in history, we're thinking of stuff like violence and proximity to cannibalism. We don't have any scientific parameters to measure how bad a time is for the people living in it, though we can make educated guesses. When it comes to actual scientists though, they don't bother with guesses or estimates and have calculated the exact year it was the worst time to be alive in history, the year 536. Apart from the falling empires the world over and general political chaos, the year 536 also marked one of the worst global famines in human history. The famine was due to ash in the air blocking the sunlight, which isn't surprising as there were also quite a few humongous volcanic eruptions around that time for good measure. The foggy eclipse of the sun, as it was described then, was visible everywhere in the world, giving the whole thing an even creepier vibe. Combine that with brutal conflicts in many places around the world, and you know why the researchers chose the year 536 to be the absolute worst one in history. So basically, year 536 was just hell on earth. Everyone was either dying or fighting, or they were dying of not having any food at all. It's kind of crazy to think that only a few thousand years ago, this could have been us. Nowadays, farming is so advanced that most of us are in a pretty good place when it comes to food, but back then, if the river dried up or the sun didn't come out, that was it, guys. We just aren't going to be eating anymore. Just be thankful that the year is 2022 right now and not 536. Kicking off at number 5, the witch is well. And whilst Europe as a whole has had a long tragic line of witch hunting throughout its long and bloody history, there is perhaps one location in Scotland that exemplifies that period more so than any other. Edinburgh Castle is a hive of activity, a beautiful structure that speaks of the city's ancient roots and its mystical origin, but as you walk around its high walls you'd may be amiss to know that you're walking amongst the same ground of a brutal and horrifying massacre that stretched out over a century 
century. Now, the Witch's Well, a cast iron fountain and plaque, honours the Scottish people who were burned at the stake at Edinburgh Castle between the 15th and 18th centuries. But it was the 16th century and one king in particular where the Witch's Well saw more bloodshed than anywhere else in Scotland. King James VI and I of Scotland and England respectively was certainly an intriguing figure throughout British history, but it was his unique brand of zealotry that led to the deaths of thousands of innocent women, each of them without a trial. King James believed that witchcraft was a form of Satanism and that anyone who possessed the abilities that he perceived as mystical, be it herbology or even dancing, were in fact possessed by the devil himself. You see, King James was obsessed with the notion of witchcraft and would write countless literature about demonology, but all of this culminated in a period that ran throughout the 17th and 18th centuries at Edinburgh Castle. As a result, more than 4,000 alleged witches, nearly all of them female, were mercilessly put to death. In fact, so many of them were brutally murdered that the usual act of burning at the stake was replaced with routine hanging, the last of which took place in 1728. During this horrifying satanic panic, pretty much anyone and everyone could be unrightfully accused of practicing black magic. Many of those that were killed were keen herbalists demonstrating an ancient practice of medicine. Some of them were mentally ill and wrongfully deemed possessed and even rarer, some of those killed were merely on the wrong end of someone else's malice, murdered over a squabble. It was a brutal time not only in Scottish history but the entirety of the British Isles and the Witches Well at Edinburgh Castle stands as a monument, a mortal reminder of those vile deeds. Swinging in at number 4, Scarra Bray. And to be honest, I just love saying that name, Scarra Bray. Scarra Bray. Feels good under the tongue, right? Well, the thing is, for this entry on our list, we're going to be going back pretty far. In fact, further back than any other entry in Scottish history, and perhaps even further back than any other historical instance imaginable, really. Scarra Bray is a location far, far older than Stonehenge and far older than even the Great Pyramids of Giza themselves, and it's tucked on a series of little islands just off the coast of Scotland, Orkney. Europe's most complete ancient Neolithic village, which, whilst being completely and utterly amazing in itself, may also be evidence of a far more terrifying event than any of us could have ever imagined. You see, there is a reason why Scarra Bray is often called the Scottish Pompeii, because although it is remarkably preserved in a similar fashion to the ancient Italian volcanic city, it also seems to be evidence of a similar sort of disaster. Back in the winter of 1850, a severe storm battered Scotland, causing immense damage to the populace and over 200 deaths. In the Bay of Scale within the Orkney Isles, the storm stripped away a mass of earth, and when the storm cleared, the nearby villagers were astounded to find the outline of an ancient village. Although the local laird, William Watt of Scale, conducted an excavation, it wasn't until 1927 that the actual location was fully excavated, which would take another 60 or so years to be completed. Originally it was thought that the site was from around 500 BC, but when radiocarbon samples were fully tested, it was revealed that Scarra Bray was built by at least 3180 BC. Now as there is evidence of the inhabitants of Scarra Bray being taken by surprise and fleeing the site in a hurry, such as remains of choice meats being cooked on the fire left behind, and evidence of one woman fleeing in such haste that her necklace broke as she tried to squeeze through the narrow doorway of her home. Now, while Scarra Bray is still very much a mystery, the leading theory is that the disaster in question was another equally terrifying storm, the same kind that unearthed it in 1850. If that's the case, I think we should be on the lookout for a storm. Number three on this list is the Coral Castle. The Coral Castle is a limestone structure located in Florida. It is super unique and has these strange limestone rocks that have been carved into various figures. Now, there's nothing inherently cursed about this place. However, similar to the pyramids or Stonehenge that we covered in our last video, people wonder how on earth this place was made. Edward Leeds Scallon was a self-taught Russian engineer who came to America. He lived from 1887 to 1951 and is credited with being the creator of the Coral Castle. What's absolutely crazy about this story though, is he constructed this structure all by himself. This is what baffles people to this day. How on earth is it possible that one man in the early 1900s was capable of moving these limestones and carving them the way that they are single handedly? These stones weigh thousands of pounds and there's no way that a man would ever be able to lift these things with sheer strength. Now he was an engineer and people have speculated that it was potentially the use of magnetism, something that he was fascinated with in his life. When asked how he was able to do this, he replied, I understand the laws of weight and leverage and I know the secrets of the people who built the pyramids. This kind of makes sense, but with the pyramids, they had thousands of people working on them all at once. You were only one man. 
People have theorized that Edward actually had some supernatural abilities that he was hiding from the public. This could honestly be believable because his personality was apparently extremely eccentric and very strange. However Edward was able to construct the Coral Castle, it truly is remarkable. Number 2 on this list is the oldest ghost story of all time. Ever wonder when all this started? When did humans start believing in ghosts or when did we have our first encounter with a poltergeist? Well a 3,500 year old tablet may have the earliest depiction of a ghost as we know them today. This is a small tablet that was made in ancient Babylon and is considered by some experts to be one of the first, if not the first, written depiction of a ghost. The ghostly drawings could be easily missed and you have to really pay attention if you're going to see it. An expert on the subject, Irvin Finkel says, you'd probably never give it a second thought because the area where the drawings are looks like it's got no writing, but when you examine it and hold it under a lamp, those figures leap out at you across time in the most startling way. The tablet goes into detail on how to get rid of ghosts and calls for an exorcist. It explains how this exorcist must make figurines of a man and a woman and also speak the words of Mesopotamian god Shemesh to get rid of the ghost. There's also a warning to the reader to not turn around, potentially an indicator that a ghost could be behind you or you could risk getting sucked into the underworld if your focus isn't steady. This tablet also lists a bunch of materials that can be used in rituals and that can be used to prevent ghosts from appearing in the first place. This is super interesting because it means that ghosts and spirits visiting the living can be traced all the way back to the ancient Mesopotamians. We were having paranormal events happen to us thousands of years ago and the action of exercising demons and ghosts. It all started with these guys. One could argue that they were the founders and innovators of a lot of our ghostly practices and knowledge to this day. Number one on this list is Oak Island. Oak Island is a very mysterious island that has been shrouded in lore for years. It's a privately owned island off the south shore of Nova Scotia, Canada. It has so many rumors surrounding it that it's even got its own television show called The Curse of Oak Island that has 8 seasons under its belt. This is a reality television show by the History Channel where they explore the mysteries of Oak Island and considering they're on season 8, it's fair to say that there have been quite a few mysteries. The one that's gained the most international fame though is the Money Pit. The Money Pit is supposedly a place on Oak Island where there's a plethora of buried treasure waiting for somebody to dig it up. This treasure was left by the pirate Captain William Kidd who lived from 1645 to 1701. There's said to be vast riches here, however no one's been able to find it up until this point. This is largely because finding buried treasure can be extremely difficult, but also due to the curse that surrounds it. The curse that hovers over this treasure states that seven men will die in search of the treasure before it's found. To this day there have actually been six deaths associated with this buried treasure. That means that if one more person was to die whilst they're looking for it, then the treasure would either reveal itself or the next person who goes looking for it would be the one who finds it. Problem with this is that there's one more person who needs to die and I don't think that anyone wants to be that unlucky number 7. Other than this pirate treasure, there's also rumored to be some extremely valuable and mystical items here. Never before seen Shakespearean plays, the Holy Grail and the Ark of the Covenant have all been linked to Oak Island. If searching for cursed treasure is your cup of tea, then this is definitely the place for you. Number 5 on this list is the Dancing Plague of 1518. That's right guys, you heard that right. A plague about dancing. Honestly, I'd never heard of this before and in my whole time working on this channel, this is actually the coolest and strangest thing that I've ever come across. So in Strasbourg, Alsace, which is now modern day France, in the year 1518, from July all the way to September, people just started dancing. For months, hundreds of people were dancing in the streets of France and they couldn't stop. It's said that one woman started dancing in the streets one day and then some more came and they just kept going for months with absolutely no reason at all. People started thinking that this was the cause of a demonic possession or some ghost that was making people lose their minds, but in actuality, nobody had any idea why these people were doing this. This wasn't a casual waltz either. These people were going hard. These people went so hard that they literally danced themselves to death. I can't possibly imagine going so hard at the club that I died, but that's basically what happened here with these people. There are actual claims that at one point in the heat of all this dancing, up to 15 people were dying per day just from dancing. This death kept happening and these people would continue dancing around all of these bodies. This plague went on until September when it just suddenly subsided and that was that. No explanation, no reasoning behind it, they just went hard for several months and then stopped. 
That's why everyone thinks that something demonic has to be the cause of all this. Some people have speculated that food poisoning may have played some role, but that just doesn't make any sense to me because it went on for months. Seriously folks, please comment down below what you think about this or some theories about why this happened because it has me pretty baffled. Number 4 on this list is the lost city of Atlantis. Atlantis is a city that is considered to be a utopian society in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. It was first documented by Plato in two of his works, Timaeus and Critias. Now even though Atlantis is often referred to as a city these days, back then Plato described it as an island. This island was located in the Atlantic and was said to be pretty massive, bigger than Asia Minor and Libya combined. This island, or city, was extremely wealthy and had a surplus of resources. This is what led them to being considered a utopia and a highly advanced group. Now Plato describes a great battle between these Atlanteans and the Athenians and says that after lots of hard fighting, the Athenians eventually prevailed in the war. Then several massive earthquakes caused the earth to shift and the entire island of Atlantis was swallowed up by the sea and now rests at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean somewhere. Many people have speculated on how accurate these tales from Plato are, with experts believing that this could just all be a myth. However, the legend of Atlantis started to circulate around Europe many years later and people began searching for this lost city. Nobody has found it to this day, but that doesn't mean that it never existed. Maybe we're just thinking about it the wrong way. Some people have thought that this entire city of Atlantis could have been aliens coming down to Earth and that potentially this island was never really an island to begin with. Plato does describe the society as being a utopia, and an explanation for that would be aliens that have far better technology than we do. Maybe when this island apparently disappeared, these aliens just left. Now that does beg the question, if they're so advanced, how on earth could the ancient Athenians beat them in a battle, which I do think is a very fair point. I do believe that Plato and the people after him have exaggerated this story, and the full truth has probably been lost in history. But I also believe that this tale didn't just come out of nowhere, and something potentially paranormal could be at hand. Number 3. The Smurl Haunting The Smurls moved into their dream home in West Piston, Pennsylvania, August 1973. They claimed that the premises were disturbed by a demon that caused loud noises and bad odors, eventually even throwing their dog into a wall, shaking their mattresses, pushing their daughters down a flight of stairs, and then physically assaulting some family members on several occasions. In 1986, the family had had enough and brought in the pair of demonologists, Ed and Lorraine Warren. According to Ed Warren, the demon that inhabited the Smurls home was very powerful, shaking mirrors off the walls, moving furniture of course about the room after they tried to persuade it to leave by playing religious hymns and praying. The Warrens claim that when a drastic temperature drop happened, a tall dark mass formed in the home and the demon left a message on the mirror telling them to quote, get out. After months of investigation, the Warrens alleged that they had a number of audio tapes containing knocking and movement sounds made by the demon. Spokespeople for the Roman Catholic Church said that the home was blessed by several priests who said that they saw no harmful activity. The Smurls, however, claimed a priest performed three unsuccessful exorcisms and that the demon avoided the rites by moving between the floors of the home. That same year, the pastor of Immaculate Conception Paris in West Piston said the Smurls felt that after intense prayers, things were finally back to normal. After the Smurl family moved, the next family never encountered anything supernatural while living there. Huh. Hoax or haunting? What do you think? Number 2. Amityville The Warrens are best known for their involvement in the 1975 Amityville Horror Investigation. New York couple George and Kathleen Lutz claimed that their house was haunted by a violent, demonic presence so intense that it eventually drove them out of their home with mental health problems. The reported haunting was the basis for the 1977 book and adapted into the 1979 and 2005 films of the same name, while also serving as inspiration for the film series that followed. Though their investigations remain intriguing, the Amityville horror case was Ed and Lorraine Warren's claim to fame. In November 1974, 23 year old Ronald DeFeo Jr., the eldest child of the DeFeo family, murdered his entire family, including all of his siblings, in their beds with a 35 caliber rifle. Ugh. The infamous case became the catalyst for the claim that demons and spirits haunted the Amityville house. In 1976, George and Kathy Lutz and their two sons moved into the Long Island home and soon believed a demonic spirit was residing there with them. George said that he witnessed his wife transforming into a 90 year old woman and then levitating above their bed late at night. They even claimed to see slime seeping out of their walls and a pig like creature running around their house. Even more unsettling, knives flew off the counters, pointing right at family members. 
It got so violent and unpredictable that the family walked around the house with a crucifix, reciting the Lord's prayers around their neck. On their final night there, they say banging as loud as a marching band was coming from the house. 28 days after being in the house, they had to leave. Yeah, no doubt. Ed and Lorraine Warren visited the home, and according to the Warrens, Ed was thrown to the floor and Lorraine felt an overwhelming demonic presence. Along with their research team, they claim to have captured a picture of a spirit in the form of a little boy on the stairway. The story became so infamous, the couple passed a lie detector test with flying colors. That's terrifying. Their son, Daniel, admits that he still has nightmares about the horrifying things that he experienced in the house growing up. Yeah, gruesome stuff. I won't spoil act three, but it gets dark, dark and bloody. Speaking of gruesome, and our number one spot, Michael Taylor. It's 1974, Yorkshire, England, Michael Taylor, age 31, father of five and husband to Christine Taylor. Michael was a well-mannered and caring father and husband. Michael, like anyone, became depressed from a back injury and left him short on work and oddly off. After seeking religious advice and one-on-one -on -one sessions at a local church, Michael started having outbursts and acting aggressively. Puzzled, of course, he seeked one-on-one -on -one sessions which turned ugly very soon. After apparently changing form and attacking Marie, a young religious leader helping Taylor and unable to remember anything, Michael and the church agreed that an exorcism was necessary. Father Peter Vincent and Reverend Raymond Smith met at St. Thomas and started. It got so violent, he was even tied to the church floor. After hours in the middle of the night, the two had managed to exercise more than 40 demons out of Michael, in which they had appeared around them as they exited. Violence continued, leaving only three remaining for the next day. After returning home from the first session, Michael was found now hours later, naked in the middle of the street, covered head to toe in blood. Michael apparently had returned home, which then his wife and family dog lay dead as the police arrived in the AM. He was arrested soon after for the death of his wife. Michael had this to say about his late wife in court. Quote, released. I am released. It is done. The evil in her has been destroyed. He was acquitted on psychological conditions and the jury found that he had met his breaking point during the exorcism. He was acquitted on insanity and remained in and out of facilities until he passed in 2013. Number five, the original Night Stalker. The original Night Stalker, or as he's better known, the Golden State Killer Cold Case, is one of the most infamous and complex criminal investigations in recent memory. For over 40 years, the identity of the Golden State Killer remained a mystery as he committed a series of brutal crimes, assaults, and burglaries across California in the 1970s and 1980s. Now for decades, this case was pretty open and was only closed in recent years around 2018 when Joseph James D'Angelo, a former police officer, was identified as a suspect through DNA evidence. D'Angelo was arrested and charged with 13 counts of murder and numerous other heinous crimes, bringing a small sense of closure to the victim's families and a reminder of why to never give up on an unsolved case. The Golden State Killer case also highlights the power of DNA in solving cold cases because it was the use of a public DNA database that allowed investigators to link DNA from the crime scenes to a distant relative of D'Angelo, which ultimately led to his identification and arrest. This particular breakthrough actually sparked a renewed interest in the use of genetic genealogy and criminal investigations with many other cold cases being re-examined in light with this similar technique. The whole case as well also showcases the importance of agency cooperation and the need for continued efforts to share information and resources between law enforcement agencies. This case involved jurisdictions across California and it was only because they all came together to all work on the same goal that they were able to solve it. Now while the arrest and conviction of Joseph James D'Angelo does provide a little bit of closure to the victim's families. It is also a stark reminder of the many, many unsolved cases across the country and the need for continued efforts to bring justice to victims and closure to their families. And if you're looking for more cold cases, true crime, mysteries, cryptids, we have just about all of that and then some on Top 5 Scary. Basically anything freaky under and above the sun you can think of, we've done a video or two on. So hit subscribe, make sure you hit that bell, but hey, please. Do that at the end of this video, because I got more freaky cold cases for you coming right up. Number four, the Lady of the Dunes. The Lady of the Dunes is the nickname given to an unidentified victim whose body was discovered in the sand dunes near Provincetown, Massachusetts in 1974. The woman was estimated to be between 25 and 40 years old and her body showed signs of a brutal attack, including being nearly decapitated and having her hands severed. For 50 years, 
This woman's identity was completely unknown. A true Jane Doe and a tragically forgotten case. Now over the years there have been numerous leads and potential subjects and all sorts of wild claims all trying to help in their own way including claims that the victim was an extra in the movie Jaws which was being filmed in the area at the time. There's actually more evidence for that than a not. In recent years though advancements in DNA technology have kind of renewed hope for this case. In 2010, a woman came forward claiming to have seen a man carrying a shovel in the area where the body was discovered. The woman was able to provide a composite sketch of the man and DNA was later extracted from a hair found in the victim's hand that matched a family member of the potential suspect. Eventually, Forensic studies of the bones would reveal the identity of our mystery Jane Doe was a woman named Ruth Marie Terry. Now the lady of the Dunes case is a haunting reminder of the many unidentified victims, but there are so many countless others who don't. It's another reminder, much like the Golden State one, that even if a case has been on ice for years and years and years, eventually technology will catch up. And as long as someone keeps pushing on a case, eventually these cases will get solved and bring just a tiny bit of closure to the victim's family. Next up at number 3, The Massacre of Glencoe. And this one in particular has been immortalised in countless fictional works, paying homage to a terrifying and bloodthirsty event in Scottish history. But as is the case with many things, the truth of this historical instance is full of far more horror than in fiction. Now, the Jacobite uprising was a particularly complex and brutal time in the history of the British Isles, but the worst of it culminated in the Scottish Highlands. After losing the throne of England and Scotland to William III, in March of 1689, after landing in Ireland, in an attempt to regain the throne, James II and VII recruited a small force of Highlanders to support him in his campaign through Scotland. Now it's important to note that many Scottish clans have remained loyal to King James, the most profound of which were the McGregors, the Keppoch Macdonalds and of course the Glencoe Macdonalds. And keep that name in mind. You see the thing is in August of 1691 the government had offered an indemnity to all Scottish chiefs as long as they swore an oath of allegiance before New Year's Day January the 1st 1682. In total the Secretary of State at the time Lord Stair offered a total of 12,000 British pounds for swearing their allegiance to King William which as you may imagine was quite the allure for many other Jacobite leaning chieftains. On top of that letters of fire and sword were sent out authorising savage attacks on anyone that would not comply to the order and interestingly enough it worked. Pretty much all of the Scottish chiefs took the oath. However, Chief Alexander Macdonald of Glencoe wasn't so sure and he had postponed his submission of the oath until December 31st, 1691. You see, at the time he was hosting 120 men of the Earl of Argyle and he wouldn't be able to make it to the nearest magistrate of Fort William until January the 6th. Hearing that news, King William ordered swift punishment to the Macdonalds and the next moment, over 100 of the Earl's soldiers who had been quartered amicably at Glencoe for more than a week suddenly turned and attacked the Macdonalds. 33 men, 2 women and 2 children were slaughtered by their own guests who had been fed and watered and entertained without a second thought. And now we can sort of understand the importance of hospitality, can't we? Hopefully. Coming in at number 2, The Black Dinner. And if that previous entry sounds like something straight out of Game of Thrones then that's because George R. R. Martin was pretty damn inspired by British history, particularly the history of Scotland. And while this one instance in particular may well seem pretty damn familiar, but that also doesn't make it any less terrifying because like I said, history is far more horrifying than fiction because the Black Dinner actually happened. Let's take it back to the year of 1440, a tumultuous time in Scottish history during the reign of King James II who was just 10 years old at the time. You see, Scotland was under the shaky yet tentative power share and regent rulership of two men, Sir Alexander Livingstone and Sir William Crichton. It was the second period of regency in a short space of time after King James I was also briefly under the same sort of stewardship. You see, one of those previous regent stewards was a man named Archibald Douglas, 4th Earl of Douglas, who was an all around pretty decent guy, so much so that in this story you could consider him to be Ned Stark. You see, by the 15th century the Douglases had become so powerful and damn honourable that some schemers such as Livingston and Crichton saw their family as a threat to the stability of the nation. In 1440 the grandson of Archibald, the 16 year old William Douglas, 6th Earl of Douglas was invited to Edinburgh Castle for a spectacular feast alongside his younger brother David. The two of them were invited to dine beside the 10 year old King James II and on November 24th 1440 the small Douglas 
Douglas entourage had arrived. According to legend, the banquet was held in the Great Hall of Edinburgh Castle and the young king was completely enamoured by the charming and noble Douglases. At the end of the feast though, after the hall went silent, the head of a black bull was brought out on a platter and paraded in front of them. Under ancient Scottish custom, the head of a black bull was the symbol of death and in rare customary moments, this formality presaged the death of the principal guests of a feast. As the legend goes, King James II was alleged to have pleaded for the lives of his new friends and for the Douglases to be spared, but it is said that his pleas fell on deaf ears, even as king. Both William Douglas and David Douglas were beheaded in front of the then 10 year old king. And finally coming in at the one spot, Sawney Bean. Because talking of dinner, we certainly can't make this list without featuring perhaps the most notoriously grim instance of folklore in Scottish history, the legend of Sawney Bean. Now also, whilst this entry is potentially the most gruesome in the whole of Scottish history, it's also important to note that not all of the legend of Sawney Bean can be historically verified, and the vast majority of it is resigned to the whisperings of folklore. It's just food for thought. Sorry, I'll stop talking about food now. You see, little is known about the early life of the notorious Sawney Bean, but it is said that he may have been born in East Lothian sometime in the late 16th century. When he reached adulthood, he became a ditch digger, but it seemed that the life of honest labour was not for him. He left home with a, and I quote, a vicious woman named Agnes Douglas, who apparently shared Sawney's inclination for ferocity after being accused of being a witch. On the way, they'd rob anyone that crossed their path, and this is where their first taste for a far more sinister crime began to establish itself. It is said that on the road, Sawney and Agnes cannibalised one of their victims. Eventually the couple settled in a coastal cave, a place hidden just beneath Banay Head between Girvan and Ballantrae, where they lived undiscovered for over 25 years. As the legend goes, the cave that they made their home was 200 yards deep and the entrance was completely blocked by water during high tide. And if that sounds like the perfect place to establish an incestuous tribe of cannibals, then that's because it was. You see, Bean and Agnes produced 8 sons, 6 daughters, 18 grandchildren and 14 granddaughters daughters, the majority of which were the produce of incest between their children. At the height of their terrifying reign, the Bean Clan would carefully lay ambushes on the nearby road at night to rob and murder individuals or small groups. Their bodies, stripped and picked clean, would be brought back to the cave where they were eaten. Leftovers were pickled in barrels or dried like jerky. One night, however, after trying to ambush a newly married couple, the Bean Clan met their match and the young groom fought them with a pistol and sword in combat. Eventually their secret cave was routed and the Bean Clan was captured and executed. Now, the the actual details of which are down to wild speculation, but one thing is for certain, the cannibal clan of Sawney Bean were said to have murdered and eaten over 1,000 victims. Oh, and also one version of the legend states that the tribe were never actually captured, and the nearby townsfolk were too terrified to go into the cave, so they just blew it up with dynamite. And I don't know about you, but that sounds like a sequel to me. Number five, the wow signal. In a 1959 paper, Cornell University's physicists had speculated that any extraterrestrial civilization attempting to communicate with radio signals might use a frequency of 1420 megahertz, which is naturally emitted by hydrogen, the most common element in the universe. In 1973, after completing an extensive survey of extra galactic radio sources, Ohio State University assigned the big ear to the scientific search for extraterrestrial intelligence famously known as SETI. Giant dish. Think Jodie Foster in contact. 1977, Jeremy Amon, a SETI volunteer astronomer, was analyzing by hand large amounts of data processed by an old IBM computer. He spots a series of signal intensities and frequencies that left him and his colleagues astonished. The WOW signal was the first radio signal detected from Earth. The signal came from the direction of the constellation Sagittarius. Eamon discovered the anomaly a few days later while reviewing the recorded data. Impressed by the result, on the computer printout, he circled 6EQUJ5 and wrote three letters beside it. WOW leading to the event's famous name. The signal lasted for the full 72 second window during which Big Ear was able to observe it, but has not been able to detect it since, despite several attempts by Eamon and others. It remains as 2020 the strongest candidate for an extraterrestrial radio transmission ever detected. To this day, nobody can explain the signal, even though many have tried claiming it could, could have just come from us. 
I don't know. What do you think? Number four, Harvard psilocybin experiments. Operation Midnight Climax, 1954, consisted of a series of CIA run safe houses and what went on inside them in San Francisco, California, and New York City. In 1960, two psychologists, Timothy Leary and Richard Alpert, ordered psilocybin from a Swiss company named Sandoz with the intention to test if different administration modes lead to different experiences. They believed that psilocybin could be the solution for the emotional problems of the human brain. The first test group was 38 people of various backgrounds. 167 subjects in total participated in the study, willing or unwilling. In 1961, Leary decided to orient the study towards psilocybin mushrooms and the rehabilitation of prison inmates. The San Francisco safe houses were closed in 1965, and the New York City safe houses soon followed in 1966. Operation Midnight Climax and Project MK Ultra were considered to be so secretive that few people, even of the highest government positions, knew of their existence. Midnight Climax being a sub-project of MK Ultra's The Mind Control Research Program that began in the late 1950s by Dr. Sidney Gottlieb, who was a chemist of the CIA. Unlike Project Artichoke, Operation Midnight Climax gave Gottlieb permission to test drugs on unknowing citizens, which made way for the legacy of this operation. Hundreds of federal agents, field operatives, and scientists worked on these programs before they were shut down in the mid-1960s. Hmm, science or sinister? Number three, Christy Mirak. The Christy Mirak case is a decades-long unsolved true crime that shook the small community of Lancaster, Pennsylvania in 1992. Mirak was a 25-year-old teacher teacher who was brutally beaten and assaulted in her home while getting ready for work, which would lead to her death. Despite extensive investigations and DNA evidence collected from the crime scene, this case would remain unsolved for over 25 years, where it would remain on ice tucked away in a back folder until 2018, when investigators used the technology, genetic genealogy, which we mentioned before, to identify one Raymond Rowe, a local disc jockey, better known as DJ Freeze as the perpetrator behind the crime. We explained it a little bit before, but I kind of glossed over it. Genetic genealogy works by uploading a suspect's DNA to a public genealogy database, which then searches for genetic matches among millions of people who've uploaded their own DNA. Think of it kind of like a DNA Google. In Rowe's case, investigators found a match through his second cousin's DNA, which ultimately led to his arrest. Isn't that a little bit interesting how many of these cases it ended up being they could track it through someone who was related to the suspect? I just find that fascinating. Rowe eventually pleaded guilty to the killing of Christy Mirak bringing a small sense of closure to her family and the Lancaster community. This case was one of the first successful uses of genetic genealogy in a criminal investigation, and has since sparked a renewed interest in solving other cold cases like some of the ones we've mentioned here, actually. Here's hoping that technology can keep being put forward for more cold cases and we can solve as many of them as possible. Number two, Linda Pagano. In 2014, a Reddit user going by the name Call Me Ice shared a story about an unidentified set of bones that was lying in a cemetery in Strongsville, Ohio. This user was researching another cold case at the time, clearly a hobbyist, and while searching for genealogy records, came across this Jane Doe skeleton and was fascinated by it, wondering why there was never an effort made to identify who the bones belonged to. Wishing to write an ancient wrong, the user posted to the subreddit Unresolved Mysteries in the hopes of crowdsourcing some answers. The Strongsville Jane Doe, as she was known, was first found in 1975 by three people who were exploring a nearby forest. They found a skeleton lying on a sandbar, mostly intact, but missing some of its jaw. The bones were reported, and it was found to belong to a woman estimated aged 18 to 25, who'd suffered a fatal gunshot five months before being discovered. Police checked her across several missing women cases, but were unable to make any connections, and the trail went cold until 2014, when Reddit started to look into it. Eventually, the original poster got in touch with the cemetery and managed to get access to original autopsy files, including a photo of the skull. It was sent to a digital artist, and nothing much happened until in 2016, the forensic artist who had done the reconstruction came across a listing on the National Missing and Unidentified Person System, or NAMIS, of a woman named Linda Pagano, who had disappeared under mysterious circumstances. 
circumstances around 1974. Linda had come home from a concert and gotten into an argument with her stepfather and supposedly left to go visit her mother. This was the last time anyone had ever seen Linda Pagano. The forensic artist then contacted the medical examiner's office and pulled Linda's dental records, matching Linda Pagano to the Strongsville Jane Doe, solving the mystery. Now, the identity of the attacker was never found, with some suspecting that it was her stepfather, but the family was able to find the smallest closure in knowing what became of Linda, and it never would have happened without a Reddit post. It's inspiring in a small way to know that sometimes when law enforcement agencies can't finish the job or can't close a case, that there are people out there who are willing to open source it. Keep that in mind for this similar case, also solved by the internet. Number one, the Grateful Doe. The Grateful Doe is a notable missing persons case, a heartbreaking and mysterious cold case that baffled investigators for decades. This case began in 1995, when a young man was tragically killed in a car accident on Interstate 95 in Virginia. He was believed to be in his early 20s, but had no identification of any kind on him at the time of the accident. The only clues anyone had for his identity was that he was wearing a Grateful Dead t-shirt and had Grateful Dead tickets in his back pocket and was on the road in a van. And so people assumed he was probably going to see the Grateful Dead, leading to the sobriquet Grateful Doe. Despite extensive efforts to identify the young man, including releasing sketches and posting information on missing persons databases and Grateful Dead fan forums just in case anybody was plotting to link up with him, he remained unidentified for two decades, 20 years. In 2015, a breakthrough finally came through when a Redditor recognized the victim from a photo of him taken at a Grateful Dead concert in 95. The photo was posted by the victim himself, who had written that he was looking for a ride to the next concert following the dead on tour. With the help of the Reddit community and DNA testing, the victim was finally identified as one Jason Callahan, a 19 year old from Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Callahan's family had reported him missing in 95, but they apparently were not aware of his interest in the Grateful Dead and had not connected him to the unidentified victim in Virginia. Now, the Grateful Doe case is another interesting one showing the power of the internet being used for good. The internet doesn't get used for good that often. It's nice to see the efforts of a determined group of online sleuths and hey, fans of the Grateful Dead, let's be real, helping to bring closure to a family who had been searching for over two decades. And like all these other cases, it just goes to show that a cold case is never truly closed until you actually get some answers for it. It took them two decades of nothing until leads basically landed right in their lap. Sometimes you just gotta wait for technology to catch up. Now, while the circumstances surrounding his death are a bit of a mystery still, the identification of him have allowed his family to have a little bit of rest and allow us to move on from this case. Kicking off at number five, the Birdcage Theater. And if you're particularly interested in the breakneck history of the Wild West, then this place may already sound a little familiar to you. Tombstone, Arizona, the last boom town of the American frontier, it's an important place enough, and it appears that all of the bloodthirsty moments moments of violence and murderous revenge all seem to happen in one location. The Bird Cage Theater originally opened on December 26th, 1881 by owners Lottie and Billy Hutchinson with the intention of being a respectable variety show theater for the equally respectable inhabitants of Tombstone, Arizona. If you know anything about the history of Tombstone though, respectable didn't exactly meet their aspirations and Billy and Lottie quickly began to cater for a different kind of crowd entirely. It is said that between 1881 and 1889, 26 murders were documented as taking place at the birdcage, mainly for its reputation as being a melting pot meeting point for every criminal and gunslinger in the Wild West. In fact, the longest poker game in history was played in the basement of the birdcage theater, which still holds the record to this day. Anyone who entered the table had to pay $1,000 up front, which was a small fortune back in the day, and notable players included Bat Masterson, Diamond Jim Brady, Adolphus Bush, Doc Holliday, and the legendary Wyatt Earp. The poker game itself ran for the entire duration that the Birdcage Theatre was open, operating 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, for a total of 8 years. It is believed that over 10 million US dollars were exchanged in the game for its duration, which is insane when you think about it. Regardless though, with as much intrigue and cold hard cash pouring into the place, people obviously clamoured for a slice of that pie, and the Birdcage was the site of countless bloodthirsty altercations, and still to this day, the souls of many unfortunate frontiersmen and women are said to roam its ruins. Also, if you 
you haven't seen Tombstone starring Val Kilmer and Kurt Russell, stop what you're doing right now and go and watch it. Coming in at number four, The Horse You Came In On, which, come on, is an awesome name for a bar, right? Sadly for us though, its original name was far less mysterious. But it's also the second place of intrigue on our list that just so happens to serve booze. And for this particular establishment, there is one infamous ghostly figure that may be inexplicably tied to its history. Quoth the raven nevermore, our man Edgar Allan Poe. Built in 1795 in Baltimore, Maryland, and founded as a saloon under a completely different name, the bar was built next to the docks and served as a drinking hole for the sailors, shipbuilders, and other such miscreants that populated 18th century Baltimore. Obviously, this combination was a winning one, and the saloon soon garnered the attention of a much more haunted kind of clientele, none other than Edgar Allan Poe. You see, as the legend tells it, this bar was the last bar that Poe would pass on his way home. And you know, given the kind of musings that he was frequent to, it often required a few liquid libations to spur on the inspiration of some of the finest works of gothic horror literature ever written. In fact, Poe became such a frequent visitor to the saloon that it is widely considered to be the last place that he was seen before his mysterious death in 1849. As the legend goes, the saloon was the last place he drank before being found on the night of October 3rd, 1849, deliriously wandering the streets of Baltimore, rambling about horrors unseen. He died four days later, the cause of his death is still a mystery to this day. And some say that after leaving the bar, he was found wearing clothes that weren't his own, repeatedly calling out the name Reynolds. Some sources say that Poe's last word words were, Lord help my poor soul, but all medical records have since been lost, including his death certificate. Whatever the truth is, it is said that the bartenders often leave out a glass of cognac after last call at the horse you came in on, the drink of choice for Poe. And as they say it, every morning, they find the glass empty. Number three, Exercise Tiger. Exercise Tiger or Operation Tiger was a series of large scale rehearsals for the D-Day invasion of Normandy 1944, in which the military's lack of communication resulted in friendly fire from an allied convoy being destroyed by German submarines, resulting in the deaths of at least 750 Americans. Wow. Of the two ships assigned to protect the convoy, only one was present. The second ship that was supposed to be present had been in a collision, suffered damage, and had to be repaired in secrecy. Because Allies' naval headquarters were operating on different frequencies, the American forces did not know this, and the first practice assault took place and was marked by an incident involving friendly fire. They didn't know it was an exercise. Set for 7.30 a.m., it was to include live ammunition to acclimatize the troops to the sights, sounds, and smells of war. This followed an order made by General Dwight Eisenhower, who felt that the men must be hardened by exposure to real battle conditions. Several of the ships landing that morning were delayed until 8.30 an hour later, and some landing craft didn't even receive word of the change at all. Landing on the beach at their original scheduled time, the second wave came under fire, suffering an unknown number of casualties. Rumors circulated along the fleet that as many as 450 men were killed and it remained in secrecy and classification memos for numerous years after. I've seen Saving Private Ryan and I can only imagine what this site looked like. Number two, the Manhattan Project. Nuclear fission by chemists in 1938 made the development of the atomic project a theoretical possibility. The Manhattan Project was a research and development exercise during World War II that produced the first nuclear weapons. It was led by the United States with the support of the United Kingdom and Canada. Nuclear physicist Robert Oppenheimer was the director of the Los Alamos laboratory that designed the actual explosives. The Army Component's first headquarters were in Manhattan, hence the name, the place name, and the official code name. The project began in 1939 and employed more than 130,000 people and cost nearly $2 billion to fund. Research and production took place at more than 30 sites across the US, United Kingdom, and Canada. During 1939, physicists drafted the einstein sillard letter, which warned of the potentials of this extremely powerful creation of a new type. They had it signed by Albert Einstein and delivered to President Roosevelt. In 1941, President Roosevelt approved the atomic program and Roosevelt chose the army to run the project rather than the navy because the army had more experience with large budget scientific projects. Plutonium was then chemically separated from the uranium by scientists and the fat man and little boy implosion weapons were created at the Los Alamos laboratory in New Mexico. The first nuclear device ever detonated was the Trinity test conducted at New Mexico's Alamogordo Range 9 
1945. Little Boy and Fat Man explosives were used a month later in the atomic droppings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. In the immediate post war years, the Manhattan Project conducted weapons testings, development of new weapons, promoted and supported medical research into radiology, and it maintained control over American atomic weapons research until the formation of the United States Atomic Energy Commission in 1947. Classified stuff, people. These were very scary times. And coming in at number one, the Philadelphia Experiment. This one scares me and I pray it really is a hoax because there's a lot of documents that relate to this subject around this time that don't really add up. The Philadelphia Experiment was an alleged event witnessed by Carl Allen and the United States Navy shipyard in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in October 1943. Allen describes an experiment where the US Navy attempted to render itself invisible, cloaking the destroyer USS Eldridge and the bizarre scientific events and results that followed. On Allen's account, the destroyer was successfully made invisible, but the ship inexplicably teleported to Norfolk, Virginia for several minutes and then reappeared back in the Philadelphia yard. The ship's crew was supposed to have suffered various side effects including insanity, intangibility, and being frozen in place. The story first surfaced in late 1955 when Allen sent a book full of handwritten letters referring to the experiment to a US Navy research organization. The US Navy maintains that no such experiment was ever conducted, that the details of the story contradict well-established facts about the USS Eldridge, and that the physics the experiments they're claiming to be based on doesn't even exist. What do you think? I think this actually happened and the gruesome details of the side effects are just misinformation. I don't know. I get a weird feeling about this one. Too many science experiments at that time. Coming into number five, we have the Guy Hoddle memos. Being the tinfoil hat guy, let's kick it off with some aliens, shall we? In December 1936, a man by the name of Guy Hoddle was named acting head of the FBI's Washington field office. He was appointed special agent in charge and served until 1955. So what's so special about this guy? Well, it's the most popular searched file in the FBI vault. The new internet database housing hundreds of bureau records released under the Freedom of Information Act. In the past two years, the file has been viewed more than a million times and yet only a semi-redacted, single page memo relaying an unconfirmed report the FBI never commented on is a hot topic. 63 years ago, March 1950, it was authorized by Mr. Hoddle, taken to FBI headquarters in DC by him and addressed and hand delivered to FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover surrounding the apparent flying saucers problem. Quote, the saucers were described as being circular in shape with raised centers and approximately 50 feet in diameter. Each one was occupied by three bodies of human shape at three feet tall, dressed in metallic cloth of a very fine texture. Each body was bandaged in a manner similar to the blackout suits used by speed flyers and test pilots were familiar with. Yeah, this is alarming. It was the first file released publicly in the late 70s and posted on the FBI website for several years, but heavily redacted. It's sharpied all over the place. The guy Hoddle memo could just be a hoax or could the infamous events in Roswell in 1947 have led the FBI to this memo? For a few years after the Roswell incident, Director Hoover did order his agents on behalf of the Air Force to verify any UFO sightings. That is true, but that doesn't mean anything came back. Regardless, this FBI report looks and sounds terrifying, and a hoax gone on that long doesn't seem too plausible to me. What do you think? Number four, PRISM. PRISM is the code name for the program that the United States National Security Agency collects internet communications from various US internet companies and stores it. The program PRISM collects stored internet communications based on demands made to internet companies under section 702 of the FISA Amendments Act of 2008 to turn over any data that matches court approved search keywords. Yeah. Basically, they have the right to pry wherever and whenever they want. The NSA program began in 2007 in the wake of the Bush administration, and its existence was leaked only six years after its start by NSA contractor Edward Snowden. He basically warned us all that mass data collection was far deeper than the public knew, resulting in it being way more criminal than legal. The disclosure was published by The Guardian and The Washington Post in 2013. The leaked documents include 41 PowerPoint slides identifying several major tech companies as participants in the PRISM program, including Microsoft, Yahoo, Google, Facebook, YouTube, AOL, Skype, and Apple. Yeah, that's like the entire internet. Shortly after publication of the reports, the US Director of National Intelligence, James Clapper, released a statement confirming that for nearly six years, the government had indeed been using large internet service companies such as Facebook to collect information on foreigners outside of the US. And quote, 
defense initiative against national security threats. Yeah, admitted it too, huh? Yeah, you really can't do that as there are kind of privacy acts and laws forbidden that. In a closed door Senate hearing, FBI Director Robert Mueller said that Snowden's leaks had caused, quote, significant harm to our nation and our safety. And in 2013, the United States Department of Justice moved against Snowden with two counts of violating the Espionage Act of 1917 and theft of government property. <laughs> government property. That's funny. They then revoked his passport and two days later he flew into Moscow's international airport where Russian authorities welcomed him and eventually granted Snowden permanent residency in 2020. Traitor or hero? What do you think? Next up on number three, the legend of the death tree. For all intents and purposes, a villa Missouri is very much a ghost town. First built in 1868, the town itself has been the site of some particularly strange moments throughout history. But now with a population of just 125, the place has been in decline ever since the late 70s. Despite that though, it's particularly dark past has managed to cling on to one of its most fearsome legends. That of the death tree and the malevolent spirit of rotten Johnny Reb. You see, due to its positioning as a border state, like most places in Missouri, the town of Avila found itself split during the Civil War, with both halves falling on either side of the conflict. Because of that, Avila was the site of some rather grisly encounters, and as the legend goes, during the war, the skull of a Confederate bushwhacker was found out in the woods that bordered the town, the grim remains of one particularly bloody battle. However, instead of burying the skull, the locals hung it from a tree as a warning sign to other bushwhackers to stay put in the wilderness and not spill out their conflict toward their town. Well, obviously, this action had the complete opposite effect, and the legend of Rotten Johnny Reb was born. Ever since his skull was hung on the death tree, his spirit roamed the town, searching for unionists to murder in revenge for mocking him. Over the years, many deaths were contributed to the existence of Rotten Johnny Reb, and as his supernatural power grew, the vast majority of the remaining townspeople quickly fled a villa, terrified by the tales of the phantom bushwhacker. According to the old legend, the only way to ultimately end the curse and finally put Rotten Johnny's spirit to rest is to find his skull out in the wild, cut it down from the tree, and bury it in holy ground. However, those that knew where the death tree resided have long since passed, and so the true knowledge of its location has faded from memory. As the locals tell it, there was once a belief that black crows would flock to the death tree during the day and perch upon its twisted branches. Some say that it was an apple tree that no longer bears fruit, and if you ever find an apple out in the woods, you'll find another nearby, leading you to his ghostly realm. Swinging in at number two, the Axeman of New Orleans. And really, we can't talk about creepy North American history without addressing one of its most bloodthirsty mysteries, the Axeman of New Orleans, a murderous killing spree that reigned from May 1918 to October 1919, taking the lives of six innocent people and grievously injuring six more. And that may also have started much earlier in 1911, but that's anyone's guess. You see, despite the very public panic and revelation of his crimes, the Axeman was never identified, and the murders remain unsolved to this very day, and more than likely, they will never be solved. As the name suggests, the Axeman's modus operandi was to murder with an axe, which strangely enough, often belonged to the victims themselves. In most cases, the scene of the crime was relatively similar, where a panel on the back door of a home was removed with a chisel, where the Axeman then entered covertly. Even stranger still, none of these crimes were motivated by robbery, and the Axeman never saw fit to steal from his many victims, which begs the question, why? You see, whilst the notorious H.H. H. Holmes is widely considered to be America's first serial killer, the Axeman of New Orleans is considered to be the first and most outwardly public, toying with the Louisiana police during his campaign of terror. The vast majority of the Axeman's victims were Italian immigrants or Italian Americans, leading many to believe that his crimes were ethnically motivated. Whilst many media outlets sensationalized many aspects of his crimes, given the fact that there was next to nothing to go on, the leading theory was that the Axeman was operating on behalf of the Mafia, despite lack of any evidence whatsoever. The strangest instance of the Axeman came on March 13th, 1919, where a letter to local newspapers was sent by the Axeman stating that he would kill again at 15 minutes past midnight, but would instead spare any homeowners that were playing jazz music. That very night, every single dance hall in New Orleans was filled to capacity, and bands of all calibers played jazz at hundreds of houses and private parties across the city. There were no murders that night, and that was the last correspondence of the Axeman of New Orleans. His bloodthirsty mystery forever 
unsolved. And finally, coming in at number one spot, the Brown Mountain Lights, which is an intriguing name nonetheless, but the truth of the matter remains, there is perhaps no other such source of North American mystery than the Brown Mountain Lights, a potentially paranormal phenomena with so many differing explanations that it's anyone's guess where on earth this legend first started. The lights themselves are a series of ghost lights that emerge near Brown Mountain in North Carolina that reportedly on any clear evening can be seen for miles across the mountain overlook. Now, although there are countless instances of strange lights that emerge all across North America, the Brown Mountain lights seem to stand out as the most consistently sourced and verified. The earliest verified accounts date all the way back to September 24th, 1913, where a fisherman reported to the Charlotte Daily Observer that he had seen mysterious lights just above the horizon every single night. First dismissed as a trick of the horizon, the site became the study of the US Geological Survey, who gave credit to the witnesses' claims in 1922 by dismissing the possibility that the lights were in fact passing trains following the events of a flood that destroyed the electrical grid and the lights continued to appear during the study. Throughout history, there have been countless potential origins of the Brown Mountain lights, many of which are wrapped up in tragic tales of lost lovers or wandering woodsmen. However, the oldest and perhaps most profound explanation dates all the way back to the year 1200, where the legend goes that the Cherokee and Catawba nations engaged in a vicious battle upon the ridge of what is now known as Brown Mountain. There, so much blood was shed by either side that even the bodies of their most mighty warriors were lost beneath the soil. That night after the fight had ended and the blood spilt, the women of both tribes lit torches and they scoured the ridge for the bodies of their fallen loved ones. It is said that night after night they would light their torches again in search of their lovers' bodies never to be found. Local legend says that this mournful scene was so tragic and intense that it is forever imprinted into the historical fabric of the mountain, haunting it fraternity. Starting off at number five is the Rothschilds. With a net worth of over 20 trillion dollars, yes I said trillion with a T, the Rothschild family is without a doubt one of the most wealthy and influential families on the planet. Put that in perspective, one million seconds is about 11 and a half days, one billion seconds is over 31 years, and one trillion seconds would take 31,709 years. If they lost a hundred dollars a second, it would still take over 300 years to go broke. I lose a hundred dollars a second and I'm bankrupt before I can finish saying supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. The Rothschild family have banks all across Europe, have control over the top 8 out of 10 pharmaceutical companies in the world, over 20% of the world's sea trade is owned by them, and have major investments in some of the planet's biggest corporations, like Google, Facebook, and Procter & Gamble. In fact, the Rothschild family has dipped their fingers in so many different businesses worldwide that it's virtually impossible to avoid giving them money, which is a major constituent of their unmatched riches. But the family's greatest secret is the method in which they obtain their wealth. The Rothschild's narrative begins in the 18th century century, as they seemingly rise from obscurity to financial dominance by exploiting their strategic positioning across major financial centers in Europe to amass vast riches. Their involvement in banking and finance allowed them to capitalize on their intricate network of contacts, giving them unprecedented access to insider information and market moving events. This ability to predict and influence market trends forms the basis of their financial supremacy. Many often point to the Battle of Waterloo as a key example of the Rothschild's shadowy influence. Reportedly, Nathan Rothschild received advance news of the British victory before official messengers, enabling him to manipulate markets for his gain. This supposed manipulation of information to orchestrate financial windfalls is a hallmark of the many theories and secrets of the Rothschild family, portraying them as orchestrators of chaos and profits. It is also suggested that the Rothschild's involvement in funding wars extends beyond mere financial interests. The family's support for both sides of conflicts, coupled with their strategic positioning, has led to suspicions that they may have instigated or prolonged wars for their own benefit. Yay for war profiteering, am I right? While their wealth only grows, the Rothschild's geopolitical influence has seemed to decline, but many see it as a strategic retreat rather than a loss of power. The family's diversification into various ventures and the establishment of international financial institutions are widely interpreted as calculated maneuvers to exert control while evading scrutiny. Next up at number four is the Kennedy curse. The Kennedy curse, shrouded in an air of secrecy and foreboding, is a whispered enigma that has haunted the famed Kennedy family for generations. The tale of the curse begins with Joseph P. Kennedy Sr., a wealthy and ambitious patriarch 
patriarch who orchestrated his son's rise to political prominence. Yet, as the family's star ascended, a series of tragic and untimely deaths cast a chilling shadow. Despite what they tell you, the Kennedy curse is no mere coincidence, and that it's actually a carefully concealed revelation that threatens to unravel the fabric of American history. The curse stems from the Kennedys' hidden involvement in clandestine affairs and covert agendas. They argue that the family's connection to influential figures and powerful institutions could have exposed them to dangerous secrets that are best kept veiled. The curse acts as a symbol of the lengths to which the shadowy forces of the global elite will go to safeguard their hidden truths. The tragic events that have befallen the Kennedys over the years, including the assassin John F. Kennedy and Senator Robert F. Kennedy are thought to be perpetrated by the world's most powerful families. The curse serves as a chilling reminder that some secrets are so profound, so earth-shattering, that they transcend generations. While mainstream historians and experts dismiss the Kennedy curse as a mere sequence of unfortunate events, the conspiratorial perspective paints a different picture. It weaves a narrative of a family entangled in a web of dark secrets, woven by the hands of an elite cabal that operates in the shadows. The curse takes on an almost mythical significance, warning those who dare to pry too deeply into the affairs of the powerful, or your family might get cursed too. Number three, Operation High Jump. Operation High Jump, officially titled the United States Navy Antarctic Development Program, launched from 1946 to 1947, was a United States Navy operation to establish an Antarctic research base. The operation was organized by Admiral Richard E. Byrd. Operation High Jump, which included 4,700 men, 13 ships, and 33 aircrafts. The war's end also signaled the onset of the atomic age and a desire to secure supplies of uranium and other natural resources. With its almost unlimited mineral deposits and largely unexplored territory of the Antarctic, it was a prize. It commenced in August 1946 and ended in late 1947. Or did it? In August 1946, Chief of U.S. Naval Operations Chester Nimitz, great name, announced that a massive combined military expedition named Operation High Jump would be launched into Antarctica during summer in the most southern hemisphere. The operation involved a variety of aircrafts, including newly purchased helicopters, also known as Task Force 68. Byrd and his team established the Little America 4 base, near where three previous bases had already been situated. The frozen aircrafts would photograph as much as Antarctica's land surface as possible during the three-month operation photographing the east to the west coast, while seismology tests were also being done. Upon reaching the Ross Ice Shelf, the ships carrying aircrafts, ice vehicles, supplies, tents, sled dogs, they would all establish Little America 4 the official Antarctica headquarters. By the time Operation High Jump was completed in March, a dozen large military flights had already been to the base. One, however, did not, which resorted in the operation to take more of an aggressive search and rescue mission for a downed plane and three lost airmen. Due to the weather, the aircraft crashed and a search plane spotted the wreckage 13 days later. Their signal, painted on the wrecked wings, indicated that three of the crewmen were unfortunately dead. Since it was impossible to land in the area, messages were dropped directing the other survivors to make their way to open water about 10 miles to the north. The men successfully made the trek and were brought to Pine Island by the rescue aircraft. Other operations would follow, including the US Navy's Operation Windmill in 1947 and 1948, and eventually treaties were signed by all involved nations to ensure that Antarctica remained a non-military zone and more of a scientific hub. Number two, Operation MK Ultra. MK Ultra was the code name of a semi-legal human experimentation program designed and undertaken by the CIA. The project was headed by Sidney Gottlieb, but began under the order of the CIA director Alan Dules. The experiments were intended to develop procedures and identify which substances, such as LSD, could be used in interrogations methods to weaken individuals and force confessions from them via brainwashing and psychological torture. MK Ultra used numerous methods to manipulate mental states and brain functions such as brainwashing, hypnosis, sensory deprivation, isolation, and a variety of information seeking methods. MK Ultra was the birth and start of two other programs, Project Bluebird and Project Artichoke. It began in 1953, but was halted in 1973. It was organized through the CIA's Office of Scientific Intelligence and coordinated with the United States Army Biological Warfare. The program engaged in illegal activities, however, including the use of unwitting and non-consenting test subjects. MK Ultra's scope was pretty broad, with activities carried out under the guise of research at more than 80 institutions, including colleges and universities. Also, hospitals, prisons, and pharmaceutical companies. Yeah, they were deep. 
MK Ultra was first brought to public attention in 1975 by Congress and the Commission on CIA Activities. In 1977, a Freedom of Information Act request uncovered 20,000 documents relating to MK Ultra, which led the Senate to some hearings. Yeah. I'd think so. Boston mobster James Whitey Bulger and cult leader Charles Manson were both subjects of these experiments. Interesting. And coming in at number one, Operation Paperclip. Operation Paperclip was a secret United States intelligence program in which more than 1,600 former German SS scientists, engineers, and technicians were relocated from Germany to the US for government employment after the end of World War II, between 1945 and about 1959. But why? The primary purpose of this secret operation was US military's advantage in information against Soviets precipitating the space race. Similarly, the Soviet Union Operation Oso Aviakum did pretty well the exact same thing, relocating more than 2,200 German specialists during one night in 1946 in secrecy. Over 2,000 army personnel examined 5,000 German targets with high priority information and research surrounding rubber, oil, armored military, V-2 rockets, aircraft, equipment, radios, chemicals, medicine, you name it. They wanted that science. The US Joint Chiefs of Staff established the first secret recruitment program called Operation Overcast in 1945. Representatives included the Army Director of Intelligence, the Chief of Naval Intelligence, the Chief of Air Staff, and the State Department. 1945, Operation Overcast was renamed Operation Paperclip by the officers who would attach a paperclip to the folders of classified rocket knowledge whom were crucial to the Americans. President Truman officially approved Operation Paperclip and expanded it to include a thousand German scientists under temporary limited military custody. Basically, they were now citizens if they played ball. I can see why they kept it a secret for so long. The NASA Distinguished Service Medal is the highest award bestowed by them and after more than two decades of service, four Operation Paperclip members were awarded the medals in 1969 for their research surrounding the space race. If you're unfamiliar with the works of Annie Jacobson, I recommend you check her out for some more information. Number five, King Charles. The new King Charles, but whom was once Prince Charles, the infamous Prince Charles, yes. Seems him and Zeus have a couple of similarities there, you know? Kings of kings, and of course the whole wandering eye once in a while thing. That's right, Camilla and the prince, the infamous mistress to the once Princess Diana, may she rest in peace. The king has done some pretty sketchy things in his time, apparently. Prince Charles met Duchess Camilla, aka Parker Bowles, for the first time in the 1970s, and that's where he fell helplessly in love with her. However, Parker Bowles was not considered royal material since she was not virginal. Yeah, they have a weird uh, rule about that one, apparently. Very, very weird. When Charles was away fulfilling naval duties, Parker Bowles got engaged and was eventually married to her on-again, off-again partner, Andrew Parker Bowles. From the very beginning, Princess Diana was aware of Prince Charles' inappropriate relationship with Duchess Camilla. Despite Princess Diana's reservations, Prince Charles' current wife was also at their wedding. Ooh, that's awkward. By 1981, the crown deemed it time for the prince to be married. Though he had dated her older sister previously, the prince became engaged to 19-year-old Lady Diana Spencer. Kind of doomed from the start, no? Apparently, the princess said in an interview, I remember saying to my husband, why is this lady around? And he said, well, I refuse to be the only prince of Wales who never had a mistress. Right out in the open, eh? Like, why even marry then, you know? Call me old-fashioned, but like, Till death do you part, you know? During their rocky marriage, both Princess Diana and Prince Charles carried out affairs. I guess when it's done, it's uh, really done. Prince Charles' most well-known affair was with his now wife, Queen Consort to the United Kingdom. Of course, we all remember the infamous and risque phone call conversation in 1992 that was leaked. During the phone conversation, the King of England said some pretty explicit stuff. Yeah, Google it up. He said it, not me. Number four, King Edward VIII. Where do I start with this man? He's more controversial than Harry. Can you believe it? Don't worry, we'll get to him soon enough. And make sure you like and subscribe. It really helps the channel out, you know? We all know this man, this man, King Edward VIII, and how he infamously rejected the crown in 1936 so that he could marry a divorced American woman. Oh, scandalous. Hey, guy had to follow his heart. And that heart took him a lot of places, including Germany. Edward was in love, and much like the young princes of today, they're not necessarily hooked on the idea of marrying those arranged or fit for them. They follow their heart. King Edward was in love with one Mrs. Wallace Simpson, an American woman, but also a married woman. 
also once divorced. Breaks the rules, Eddie. However, in order to marry the woman that he loved, King Edward was willing to give up his power. And he did. Talk about passion. On January 10th, 1931, Prince Edward and Mrs. Wallace Simpson met for the first time, as well as her then husband, Ernest Simpson. Yeah, it was at this party that the first two met and fell in love. Awkward third wheel situation there, kinda. That's gotta suck being the one left for royalty, doesn't it? That's a confidence crusher. Yeah, she left me. For who? Uh, the king. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm fine. Coming in at number three is Disney. The Disney family and company is one of the most influential families on the planet. Being a household name, producing a plethora of film and television that is watched around the world. On top of making stupid amounts of money off their many franchises, such as Marvel and Star Wars, they are able to include all forms of messages that will undeniably reach the public, allowing them to influence public opinion and trends, which is a powerful tool for anyone with an agenda. On the surface, messages in Disney movies are typically simple nice things, like we should all love each other, or believe in yourself. But hidden beneath are darker subliminal messages that can influence our thoughts without us even noticing, giving us a peek into the darker side of the Disney franchise. Disney has strategically concealed subliminal messages within their animations, films, and merchandise. These messages, often imperceptible to the conscious mind, are purportedly designed to influence the thoughts, emotions, and behaviors of unsuspecting viewers and consumers. Their aim is to shape societal norms and values in alignment with a secret agenda. There have been many instances where hidden images and messages have been discovered within Disney productions. These range from fleeting frames with actual innuendos to directly referencing the Illuminati in DuckTales, to symbols that supposedly promote mind control or social conditioning. In the subtle insertion of these messages, while undetectable to the naked eye, is believed to exert a profound influence on the subconscious mind, leading individuals down a predetermined path. And I'm sure I don't have to explain to you why that's a bad thing. Skeptics, however, argue that many of these alleged subliminal messages are mere coincidences or the result of overactive imaginations seeking patterns where none exist. But if you see some of these examples for yourself, the meaning is clear. I'll still watch their movies though. Nothing tops Pirates of the Caribbean. Next up at number two is the Potsy Conspiracy. This is an old one, but its effects are still felt today. The Potsy Conspiracy, a significant historical event of the Italian Renaissance, revolves around the plot to assassinate Lorenzo de' Medici and his brother Giuliano, members of the prominent Medici family, and the broader power struggle between rival Florentine factions. Central to this narrative is the influence wielded by Pope Sixtus IV and his papal family, the Della Riviere. In the late 15th century, the Medici family, led by Lorenzo de' Medici, considerable sway in Florence, amassing immense wealth and cultivating a flourishing cultural and artistic atmosphere. This prominence, however, garnered enmity from rival factions, particularly the Pazzi family, who aimed to undermine Medici authority and establish their own dominance. The Pazzi conspiracy hatched in 1478, the Medici brothers, and paved the way for a Pazzi-controlled Florence. The Pazzi family sought to leverage the influence of Pope Sixtus IV, a rival of the Medici, to legitimize and support their scheme. As part of this intricate plot, they enlisted the aid of the Pope's nephew, Girolamo Riario, which I've pronounced wrong for sure, to orchestrate an assassination that would alter the course of Florentine politics. On April 26th, 1478, during high mass at the Cathedral of Santa Maria del Fiore in Florence, the conspiracy was set into motion. Giuliano de' Medici was killed by conspirators. S simultaneously, an attempt on Lorenzo's life occurred, but proved unsuccessful as he managed to escape. The botched assassination marked a turning point in Florentine history and the decline of the Pazzi family's influence. Pope Sixtus IV's involvement in the conspiracy further underscored the complex web of political maneuvering. The Pope's support of the Pazzi family and their ambitions highlighted the intertwining papal authority and secular power struggles. In the broader context of global politics, the Pazzi conspiracy and its aftermath contributed to a growing awareness of the influence of papal families in shaping the course of history. This realization played a role in the evolving perception of the church as a political player, influencing international relations and strategic alliances. We all know of how much influence the church has, but events like the Pazzi conspiracy allude to dark secrets surrounding the church's power over our government and way of life, regardless of religious belief. And I'd kick myself for not including this on the list at 
At number one is the Illuminati. The worst best kept secret on the planet, the Illuminati, a shadowy and elusive secret society, has captured the imagination of conspiracy theorists and curious minds alike for centuries. This theory proposes that the world's most powerful and influential families orchestrate a clandestine organization to manipulate global events and control the course of history. The methods through which these families maintain the secrecy of the Illuminati evoke intrigue and curiosity, perpetuating a sense of mystery and suspicion. A select group of elite families wield disproportionate control over global affairs, ensuring the Illuminati's existence remains concealed. These families, much like the Rothschilds, Disney's, you name it, are often identified as wealthy dynasties with long-standing legacies, collaboratively manipulating financial markets, politics, and cultural narratives to advance their own interests and agendas. The Rothschilds are often cited as evidence of the Illuminati's secretive influence. Known for their banking prowess and immense wealth, the Rothschilds have been implicated in conspiracy theories that suggest that they are key players within the secret society. The family's ability to operate across multiple continents, their strategic positioning within the world of finance, and their connections to other powerful figures are only fuel to the fire that is the Illuminati conspiracy. The Illuminati's secrecy is maintained through a combination of factors. Firstly, the families in question leverage their vast financial resources to control mainstream media outlets, suppressing information that could expose their activities and promoting narratives that suit their interests. This media manipulation perpetuates a veil of ignorance around the Illuminati, making it difficult for the public to discern fact from fiction. Secondly, the families involved with the secret society use their influence to infiltrate key institutions and governments, ensuring that anyone who threatens to expose their secrets is marginalized or discredited. This manipulation of power structures enables the Illuminati to operate with impunity, as those who might otherwise challenge their control are silenced or neutralized. Remember the Kennedy curse? That is a prime example of the suppression of opposition, with the latest unexplained tragedy occurring in 2020. Lastly, the fear of retribution or retaliation keeps individuals who may possess knowledge of the society's existence from speaking out. The families possess the means to enforce silence, using their influence to protect their interests and ensure the Illuminati remains a well-guarded secret. There have been many cases of celebrities and other public figures hinting at their involvement with the society, with photos surfacing with repeated imagery of pyramids with a single eye in them, the Illuminati's famous logo. Undeniable evidence of the secret society's existence still remains unfound, which paradoxically strengthens and weakens the Illuminati theory. Which side are you on? Team Illuminati confirmed, or do you think it's all a bunch of gobbledygook? Let me know in the comments. Number five on this list is the Catholic persecution in Britain. This happened in the 16th and 17th century and was really not a good time to be alive if you were Catholic. List first says, Britain has been trying to rebrand its historical image with tea and monocles, though it's hard to do given how violent its history has been. We're not even talking about the colonies here. A civilian in Old Britain may die in a variety of ways depending on the time period. The worst, however, would have probably been during the Catholic Rebellion and their eventual persecution. It was generally a time of upheaval in Europe, largely over the question of which kind of Christianity is the best one. The situation was especially bad in England as the ruling Protestants really did not like the Catholic population. If you were suspected of being a Catholic or harboring one, there were a number of creatively horrifying ways you could die. One woman was slowly and publicly crushed to death simply for refusing to talk when she was questioned for supporting the Catholics. You could be drawn and quartered, hung, or just lynched by a mob. The mob thing was rare as the central authorities made sure to intervene and kill you themselves before the situation got so out of hands. How nice of them. Yeah, so just a casual death by public crushing for maybe supporting Catholicism. This is a time in history that I feel doesn't get brought up nearly enough based on what happened. In all honesty, I didn't even really know about this time until I started doing some research for this video. Maybe that is because the British government has tried to do a full rebrand and doesn't really want to bring up the dark past of what was once one of the worst times to be alive. Throughout history, people have consistently been persecuted for their beliefs and how they want to live their lives. This was one of the worst examples 
examples of that in history and it's definitely not a time that you would have wanted to be alive. Number four on this list is the Siege of Sarajevo. This time really isn't that far off from us at all folks. This siege took place from 1992 to 1996. Sarajevo is the capital of Bosnia and had you have lived in this place during that time, life would have been hell. Let's first says sieges are an overall bad time to be in and we highly recommend not being in one if it could be helped. Some of the most prolonged sieges in history, like the Siege of Leningrad, have been huge humanitarian disasters too, as sieges primarily affect the citizens. One particularly horrifying siege that isn't mentioned that often is the Siege of Sarajevo by the Serbs, which is also the longest siege of a capital city in modern history. It went on for almost four years, and close to 14,000 people ended up dying. If the incessant shelling on primarily civilian areas like the market didn't get you, you could die in many other ways. People were dying just from the harsh cold as there were no fuel supplies in many parts of the city. Quite a few of them had to move into shared spaces with other families without any amenities, turning an otherwise functioning city into a giant refugee camp. Many people were killed by snipers who deliberately targeted civilians. Think about being a citizen in that city during that time. Your entire life is literally just about surviving at that point. And not just for a week or for a month, for literally four years. Four years of constant attack in horrible conditions to live in. Four years of fearing that you and your family are going to be killed. Four years of freezing and having no good food to eat at all. And this literally happened not that long ago, guys. This just as easily could have been one of us that was caught living there. You were just in the wrong place in the wrong time and now your life is uprooted and you need to fight to stay alive. Number three. Prince Harry. There's a couple things Prince Harry has done to solidify that bad boy reputation among the royals. Well, maybe less bad boy and just very bad decisions sometimes, you know? We're never gonna know why Prince Harry thought it was a good idea to wear a certain armband and a uniform resembling of that African German army to a theme party. Yeah, not so royalty stuff like that. We all remember in 2005 when the then 20 year old and the photos of him in the costume leaked online. What's with these leaders doing all these themed costume parties? Yeah, I'm looking at you Trudeau. Once the images were published, the palace was forced to do some damage control. Of course, the prince issued an apology saying, quote, I am very sorry if I have caused any offense or embarrassment to anyone. It was a poor choice of costume and I apologize. And that's pretty well it. Ah, a little sorry here and there. Or how about in 2004 when he decided it was a pretty good idea to get into a little brawl with photographers who were taking his picture when leaving a nightclub. And of course, countless times we caught the prince shirtless or making out with girlfriends for an all out not what to do on the internet media presence. I mean, the guy's just having fun. He's living his life. What do people expect, you know? What is he gonna play, polo on a horse every day and just sit on a throne? But how far do apologies go, right? Well, apparently the future king and his brother Harry haven't really spoken since the infamous interview on Oprah when Harry and his partner Meghan Markle. Apparently the future king and his brother Harry haven't really spoken since the infamous interviews on Oprah when Harry and his partner Meghan Markle opened up about the racist scrutiny that they had been under for years from both family and media. Quote, many lines were crossed by William. He was at the center of a number of painful moments, turning his back when support was needed. It was a dark time and one William hasn't really been prepared to unpack. At the same time, Prince William is still waiting for an apology from Harry for making details of private family matters public. Number two, Banished Cousins. We all know a family member that maybe aren't too thrilled about or fond at the annual barbecue to see. A little family history, a little, Oh great, look, so and so is here. Born in 1919 and 1926, Nerissa and Catherine Bowles Lyon were two of the daughters of John Herbert. John was the brother of the Queen Mother, and so Nerissa and Catherine were first cousins of Queen Elizabeth. Royal first cousins, tempting for some and hated by others. Sadly though, they were never really able to live the life of a royal family member. In the medical terminology of the early 1940s, the sisters were diagnosed as, quote, imbeciles and never really learned to speak. In 1941, they were admitted to the now closed Royal Earlswood Institution for Mental Defectives and were allegedly treated by their family as though they never existed. That's creepy. In a 1963 edition of Burke's Peerage, basically a family lineage chart, it listed Nerissa as passing away in 1940 and Catherine passing away in 1961 but they weren't dead at all. It wasn't until 1987 that the story of the sisters' existence was even published. 
In fact, it was reported that Nerissa actually had died in 1986 and Catherine was still alive at the time, sadly passing away in 2014. A scandal instantly erupted when it emerged the royal family had apparently tried to erase two of its members from their lives. In a 2011 documentary titled The Queen's Hidden Cousins, nurses and staff at Earlswood were interviewed and confirmed that to their knowledge, the royal family had never even sent the sisters a card, gift, or visit, sadly. In fact, when Nerissa died, none of the family was at the attendance of the funeral. That is horrible. Number 1. Cousin Kissers Speaking of lineage and keeping the bloodline, well, within the bloodline, the royals have had their fair share on incestuous relationships straining back almost a thousand years. The Egyptians did it, the Romans did it, and of course, the Brits have done it. Hey, when you're perfect, it's hard to find anything else perfect. Of course, lots of the royal family has been related to the people they marry. Cousins, again. A small theme with the royals. Not only do they like banishing them, sometimes and more often than once, they fall in love with them. King George IV and Caroline of Brunswick, first cousins. Queen Victoria's uncle King George IV married his cousin Caroline. George was the son of King George III, who was the younger brother of Princess Augusta Frederica. Caroline was the daughter of Princess Augusta Frederica. Of course, Queen Victoria and Prince Albert are first cousins as well. Yeah. Queen Victoria and Prince Albert were first cousins, having shared the same grandfather, Francis, Duke of Saxe Coburg Salfield. Victoria was the daughter of Francis' daughter, Princess Victoria of Saxe Coburg Salfield. Albert was the son of Francis' son, Ernest III, Duke of Saxe Coburg Salfield, and in 1863, King Edward VII, who was then known as Prince Albert Edward, married Alexandra of Denmark. Edward was the son of Queen Victoria and was the great great grandson of King George II. Queen Alexandra of Denmark was also a great great granddaughter of King George II, making them third cousins. And of course, we come to the late Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip, third cousins. Both Queen Elizabeth II and her husband, Prince Philip, could call Queen Victoria great great grandma, making them related. Elizabeth is the great granddaughter of King Edward VII, Queen Victoria's son. Philip's great grandmother was Princess Alice, Queen Victoria's daughter. Dude, trust me, I had cue cards laid out on the floor while researching this. I felt like I was mapping the Game of Thrones family tree. Yeah, so many Williams and Edwards, you know? Like, we need some new names, people. 